making our way through the book of Romans, taking one chapter and one sermon per week. We come now to Romans chapter 11, and I give you the message entitled, No Rejection. Paul begins chapter 11 with these words. I say then, he has been discussing the whole place of the Jew in the plan of God and the outworking of the gospel that Jesus Christ came to proclaim and present. At the beginning of chapter 11, he says, I say then, based upon what we have heard in chapter 9 and 10, has God has not rejected his people. Has he? And Paul says, may it never be, I too am, am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. In unmistakable terms, Paul says that God is not the one who has rejected the other party. It is rather the Jews who have rejected God and who have turned their heart away from God. And he goes here, especially to the time of the great prophet of fire, Elijah. He says, or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. What is the divine response? What is God's word on what Elijah complains to the Lord? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Yes, there was great rejection, but not all were without faith. There was yet those in Elijah's time, in that horribly dark hour, there were yet those who trusted in God and who believed his word and who had not bent the knee and bowed before Baal that they would worship him. They were yet worshipers of the one true God. And here, Paul, he says, verse 5, in the same way then there is also come to be at the present time a remnant according to god's gracious choice and paul is saying there are yet those from every tribe tongue and people who are yet trusting in god from those those from gentile parentage those from jewish heritage yet those who are trusting in god and god he has not rejected his people. Those who reject him and push him away, sad to say that they walk away from all of the privilege that God would have for them and the, and the, and the right rewards that God would have for them. God has not rejected them. How we get things turned around and backwards that God is the one who is being heavy-handed when we are the ones with blood on our hands and we are the ones who have pushed him away and we are saying we do not want to have anything to do with you we don't want to hear your decrees we don't want to hear what you have to say on the matter we are going to handle things in and of ourselves and we are going to go our own way we're the ones who are pushing God away and thereby pushing his blessing and his strength away. What does Paul go on to say? God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not. Down to this very day, Paul quotes, and he is heavy hearted for his brethren. Those for whom he has already said, I wish that I would be a cast off, a castaway, in order that they might come to know salvation in Jesus' name. But Paul, as he continues in chapter 11, he talks about grafting. Here's a wonderful thing that takes place when a stick, or, or rather a branch, can be tied into a tree of a different nature 
and the nutrients, the sap, the strength that comes up from the ground can go and be administered and applied to that which was not of nature itself tied in. And Paul says, you Gentiles, you have been grafted in to the stock, to the tree which God has planted and which God had tend tenderly cared for. You have been brought in as a wild olive branch and you have been brought in. You have tasted of the good things of God while it seems that the Jews have been pulled away at least for a time, but God is the one who is able to bring back that which has been cast off. And so you Gentiles, you should never, not for a moment, be puffed up and think more highly of yourselves than you ought to think, but realize that God is doing a great thing in grafting you in, in bringing you into blessing. So praise him and honor him and rejoice in him and realize that it is his good work. It is his good pleasure that has brought about these things. Paul is pointing out privilege. He is pointing out who is the true husbandman? Who is the gardener? Who is the one who affects these things? Is it the branch who jumps up from the ground and says, well, I'm going to join that company. I'm going to join that tree. I'm going to graft myself in. No, here is what God does as he walks about his garden and he brings us in and we taste of the good things of God and how privileged we are thereby. Paul concludes this chapter with these words. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways there is no surpassing the wisdom of god there is no surpassing the riches and the knowledge of god here we read also for who has known the mind of the lord or who became his counselor and the answer of course is no one king solomon was the greatest wise man that ever lived. But Jesus said, a greater than Solomon is here st standing before you. And he goes on, or who has given him to him that it might be paid back to him again? And Paul concludes, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory. Indeed, my friend, to him be the glory. No rejection, so don't reject him, but rather come and trust in him and in his salvation today.